the picture of a cluster of galaxies. I mean, the, the poetry of it, it, the spiritual inspiration you get from looking at a picture of a cluster of galaxies located five billion light years away from us, where every dot in that picture is a galaxy. The light from those stars left those stars before our sun and earth formed, which means that now many of the stars in that picture don't exist anymore. And if there were civilizations around those stars, each of those galaxies contains a hundred billion stars. Any civilization that existed around those stars no longer may exist. The, it, it just opens your mind to wonder. And so I actually feel very strongly that while science per se may not provide the direct consolation, it can and it should provide a spiritual, not only wonder, but it should provide a, spiritual, a consolation. We tell our kids fairy tales to console them. We tell them to make their life fun. We talk about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, but then we decide that, you know what? It's better for them to know how the world really works. And it may be a little less consoling, but in fact, knowing that they're in control of their lives actually is empowering. And many of us, if you're a good parent, you want to teach your kids how to become empowered. And yet, and in religion, they're often talked about the flock, the children, it effectively treats you like a child. It says, it's better for you to believe a fable than reality. And, and often when I, when I end a lecture on cosmology, I point out that one, the two things modern cosmology has taught us is that first, you're much more insignificant than you ever thought, and two, that the future is miserable. <coughs> but that should make you feel good, not bad, because we are so lucky to be alive today and endowed with a consciousness where we, for whatever fortuitous reasons, are on, a, on a random star in a random galaxy in the middle of nowhere, we are able to evolve a consciousness live on a relatively quiescent planet. And so I, I actually think science can provide a real consolation by saying, look, once you accept reality, it's liberating. If you invoke the God hypothesis, there's a creator did all this. Any being capable of designing particles, atoms, molecules, DNA, protein chains, cells, organisms, planets, stars, and universes can't be simple. Such a being would have to be as complex as are more complex than her creations. Thus, by all theistic arguments for God's existence, there must be a God's God who created the Christian God. And if you continue to make that argument, then there has to be a God's, God's God that made the Christian God ad infinitum. Now, you can't just say, well, you've got to stop the causal chain somewhere, and I'm stopping it at my God. Why? You're the one who initiated the argument that there has to be a designer behind the complex system. So, who designed the designer? Well, the designer is that which does not need to be created. Why can't the universe be that which does not need to be created? Because the universe is a thing and it has to be created. Well, maybe God is a thing. No, God is not a thing. God is an agent. I'm an agent. You think I was created. So, therefore, God would need to be created. Human beings were clearly programmed by evolution to impute intentionality to the world around them. Meaning and purpose was infused in all everyday events to make sense of a dangerous, difficult, and uncaring world. So we had rituals behind the sun, the moon, the planets, the wind, the earth, the oceans, in all societies. The rise of our physical understanding has slowly caused us to do away with those many gods. We no longer have Mars, the god of war, Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, the Thor, the god of storms. Everyone here, or maybe everyone, is now an atheist respect, with respect to those gods. And there's a reason for that. Science has taught us that instead of capricious beings, there's an order to nature. And that order does not appear to involve a divinity. It, there's no need for a divinity. Laws of nature describable by mathematics make predictions that allow us to not only deter, predict the future, but control it without the need for any supernatural shenanigans. And in fact, it amazes me that uh, the asking the question, is God necessary? is somehow an evil thing. When we stop asking questions, that will be an evil thing. Science has taught us also that we want to believe, in the words of Fox Mulder. And we should be skeptical of, the, of those desires. As the physicist Richard Feynman told us, the easiest people to fool are ourselves. As scientists, we have to train ourselves to be skeptical of wanting to believe. And we should try and overcome our natural tendency to assume special significance to events. 
And human beings are also inevitably programmed to ask why, as we've heard it. But the why question is ill-posed, because it presumes purpose. It presumes the answer to the question before you ask the question. What if there is no purpose? Does there need to be purpose? And science tells us there's no evidence of purpose. So the why question is ill-posed. Our opponents want to keep the clock from ticking by avoiding the evidence of reality. And therefore, science, by telling us there's no need for purpose, has refuted the need for God. I don't understand why it would be a simpler explanation to say that the world was created by a divine being who has existed forever than it would be to say that the universe has existed forever. It seems to me that to say the universe has existed forever is a simpler explanation. Now, your argument was that the universe actually hasn't existed forever, that science says there was a big bang, and this in some way supports the creationist account of the universe. All I'm saying is that science doesn't say that. Science only says the observable universe began 13 point something billion years ago and with a kind of a bang and has been expanding since. That's all it says and that's all it can say. So I'm simply saying there is no argument here to believe that your hypothesis that it was created by a divine being is in any better shape than the hypothesis that it has always Thank existed. You. On a point of logic, the burden of proof is on David to prove the existence of God, not on me to disprove the existence of God. I can't disprove Apollo and Zeus and all that. But we can, we can sort of shade our probabilities of belief by the accumulative evidence for or against the God hypothesis. There is no atheist hypothesis. That, that, that isn't a thing. Either you think there's evidence for God or, or you don't. And, and there's no alternative to that that has to be defended. All of these arguments, by the way, look like this. X looks created, whatever it is, the eye, the universe, planets, DNA. I can't think of how X was created naturally, therefore X was created supernaturally. Newton has a famous quote in which he talks about the stunning alignment of all the planets in this flat plane, the plane of the ecliptic, which all the planets are going around in the same direction. They're all in this flat plane except for Pluto, which is no longer a planet, so it's not a problem. <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, it's, it's just I can't explain, I can't figure out how this could have come about. This must have been the providence of the divine creator. But no one makes that argument anymore, which is why my intelligent design creations friends don't use that quote because we now have a cogent theory for how solar systems are formed. Naturally, all you need is gravity and some stuff in certain right configurations of how far apart they are and so on, and planets naturally form. We now know that virtually every star in the galaxy has a planet. Completely natural. You don't have to have an intervening God to step in to stir the particles to make that happen. In the long history of science, this is what happens. People invoke the gap. They say, well, I can't think of how this could have come about naturally. Therefore, it must have been supernaturally. The gaps are being filled. That's what scientists do. And eventually, those gaps will be filled. And then where goes your religious faith? If you hook your faith to something, there's this gap here. These guys can't explain this thing here. Whatever it is, the fine-tunedness of the cosmos, DNA, the eye, whatever. You can't explain that, that I'm hooking my, uh-oh, he explained it. Everyone accepts it, happened naturally, uh-oh, now what? Now what do I do with my faith? Okay, that's the problem. This is a photograph um, from Cassini of Saturn. It's a total eclipse of the sun, a scene from Saturn. But the thing that's most amazing, and this projector doesn't have the resolution to see it, if you look at this picture, in that picture, right there, you'll see a little dot, a pale blue dot, which of course is the Earth. And it seems to me that is the wonder we should be telling our kids about, showing them pictures of understanding our place in the cosmos, the earth, the center where all of our vital trials and tribulations and political battles and moral battles are being fought is that little spot, that fragile spot in a dark void. I mean, that's the kind of story we should be telling to inspire our children.